coming. I'm Stuart Parkinson. I'm Director of Scientists for Global Responsibility, and I am going to talk to you about um, one point, what does 1.5 degrees centigrade compatible living look like? So I'll push my slides up here. Go. Right. Um, and particularly focusing on what the scientific data says. So as I go through, I will let you know where the data comes from and um, where you can go and find out more about it if you're so inspired to do so. Um, yeah, so a few basics to begin with. Um, the 1.5 degrees target is as you will probably all be aware, moving quickly out of reach um, because we are not doing enough as a society, as nations um, and companies and individuals across the world. The government industry focus remains on technology change with very little focus on behaviour change. Um, and this focus has um, led to the reductions that we've seen so far were barely reductions at all in climate pollution and carbon emissions and not happening nearly fast enough um, and they are um, we need something else and it's clear that we need um, other actions um, we need reforms in the political systems the economic systems but we also need behavior change and um, there was a study by the um, uk climate change committee which is a government advisory body. And it concluded that at least 59% of required climate reductions involve some sort of behavior change. So it's the majority of actions that require us to do some sort of behavior change. And whilst often it needs to be helped by the state, the corporations, there, there's a lot of potential for us to help raise the bar and help raise the, the scale of action that's happening and help um, inspire others to take more action and indeed inspire, inspire governments and corporations to be a lot braver than they are. Um, so, and, and particularly this will come up a few times um, if you have more buying power then behavior change becomes a bigger aspect of what you can do. Um, and in fact, there's a real onus on people with more money to do more in this area. So that's the basics. I, I should just add um, what we're going to do during this talk. Um, if you want to put some questions in the chat, um, please do. And I'll try and pick up, or Emily will help me um, try and pick up some of the questions as we go. Um, and then we'll do a question and answer session after. Uh, the main part of the talk and then we'll also do some polls and, and breakout sessions um, to, to sort of um, broaden the discussion and, and try and fix some of these ideas um, more firmly. So the questions that I'm going to tackle in this presentation and in this whole session are what are the most effective actions to reduce carbon emissions on an individual basis? What, what are credible targets for sustainable behaviours? And I'll explain what I mean by, by that um, as we go. What are the side benefits of action? I won't say too much about that, um, but I'll, I'll bring it in occasionally as we go. Um, what about guilt-free activities? And I'll say a bit about that towards the end. And then, um, and then how does individual action fit within the big climate picture? And I'll, I'll say more about that. Um, and I should just emphasize, um, particularly because webinars often go far, much further afield than you think. Um, the focus of my talk is on the UK. So um, whilst a lot of things I'll say will be relevant for wider audiences, um, a lot of the data that I'm using is, or most of the data I'm using is, has a UK focus. The sources that I mainly used are um, these. So there's a new report that came out a couple of weeks ago from the Hot or Cool Institute, 
um, that's based in, in Berlin. Um, they put a, together an extensive report. It's the latest in a, in a series um, looking at this issue. There's also um, a book by Professor Mike Berners-Lee at Lancaster University um, that's aimed at the general public called How Bad a Banana is the Carbon Footprint of Everything. That's got a lot of data and that was updated last year. Um, then another source of data is the government's um, data sheets on greenhouse gas conversion factors, which um, for any data geeks among you is full of numbers to um, help guide your behavior change. And, um, and then for those who are less, um, less geek inclined, um, there's the WWF's carbon footprint um, calculator. Um, and I'll, I'll put some links to these things in the chat uh, um, as we go, probably towards the end, actually. Um, and the WWF one is, is quite um, accessible and, and gives you an idea, although some of the data is not too up to date. Um, it probably needs a, another bit of an update with some of the latest numbers. Um, but it gives a, a good idea, especially for when you're starting out or encouraging friends and family to start out. So, um, so I'm going to start with a, a bit of um, science and ethics behind um, so, uh, this area. Um, so the first starting point is um, the global carbon budget. How much of this have we got left? So to keep the heating below, to keep global heating below um, the magic target of 1.5 degrees centigrade as specified by the Paris Climate Agreement, um, figures in the IPCC report, the, the um, UN climate advisory body um, called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change points towards a, a 500 billion ton target. Um, and a, a, there's another piece of jargon here, tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is the way that we measure um, emissions in this area. Um, so 500 billion sounds quite a lot. It's not actually very much at all. And that entire budget will be used up by the end of the decade. Um, if we don't change course, if the world doesn't change course drastically. Um, and that's why they said, you know, that's why a lot of the um, discussion is about, you know, this is the decade to make or break things. Um, if, we, if we reduce our emissions, we buy ourselves maybe another decade, if we reduce our emissions faster than even another decade and so on. So when people talk about 2050 targets, um, this uh, has to be borne in mind that, um, we need to, most of the reduction needs to happen this decade. And um, so that leads to, if, if we take that budget and we average um, it amongst the world's population and then um, um, extrapolate it from where we are now to where we need to be, you get the curve on the right. And there are two parts of this curve. So that they, and this is expressed, this is carbon footprint per person per year. So this is the emissions due to all your buying activities, not just the direct pet activities like um, burning petrol in a car or um, burning gas in a boiler, but it includes the life cycle impacts of the extraction of the raw materials and the manufacture of the products. So this is, is a full carbon footprint. Um, and if you spread it out across the world, you get the dark blue curve um, across time. So 6.3 tonnes in 2015, which was when this curve was first um, produced and it's been updated, um, going down to 0.4 tonnes per person um, by 2100. And but a lot of, well, a large fraction of that behavior, a large fraction of that emissions isn't due to what consumers can affect in their own lifestyle. So you can make choices about what you buy um, in your own lifestyle. This is called a lifestyle carbon footprint. Um, and that's about 70% of, of the um, total amount. Um, and that's what we're gonna focus on today is the lifestyle carbon footprint the footprint that you can affect through your behavior, um, particularly as a consumer. And we're going to focus on the target of the 2030 target. So if you look on the graph on the right of 2030, look on the um, light blue line, you'll see 2.5 tons. So that's what we're going to focus on today and look at what behaviors 
you um, will need to undertake in order to hit that target, or everyone will need to undertake to hit that target, everyone in the UK. And um, just to quickly mention the ethical considerations, so we're assuming an equal target spread across the world, so it's based on equity as laid down in the UN treaties on climate change. And um, we also take consideration of what's called sufficiency. So you've got enough, um, enough to um, provide basic needs. So basic needs of, of energy for warmth and, and cooking um, and lighting and um, basic needs for food, nutrition, a um, uh, basic level of transport, things like that. So th those are considerations as well. So that's the, the the sort of overarching science and ethics. Um, so what this boils down to is that in the UK, our current total footprint, current total carbon footprint per person is about 12 tonnes at the moment. Um, now that's the total footprint. The lifestyle footprint, so the bit, bit you can affect with your behaviour, is about 8.5 tonnes. Um, and where it needs to be by 2030, and arguably for a number of reasons before then, needs to be around 2.5 tonnes. So you need, it needs to be reduced by about two thirds from where it is now, um, six, yes, about two thirds, three quarters. Um, so the first question, and I'm, I'm gonna um, run a poll at this point, how close do you think you are to that target lifestyle? 2.5 tons. I will, I'm, I'm not assuming any knowledge here. I just want to start with an idea and find out where you think you might be. And then at the end, we will do another poll and see um, how much closer you think you might be um, or further away, um, depending on what the information is in the rest of the talks. So, um, so we've got a poll here. Um, how close do you think your lifestyle is to 1.5 degree compatible? So this 2.5 tons target um, and a series of options. And one of them is I don't know, because if you really don't know, a lot of people don't know, just say I don't know, that's fine. So I'll launch the poll now. And um, I'll give you um, a minute or two to fill it in. It's still rising. Oh, nearly 80, 90 percent participation. That's good. Few polls do that well. I think that's probably it now. Any more? Right, we'll go with that. Oh, right, right up to 30. Any last ones? Right, okay. We'll end the poll there. 93.5% participation, very good. Right, so um, you can see the results here. Um, and you can see that 70% reckon that they're better than average, but not very close to the 1.5 target. So that's quite interesting. I, I guess I, I'm not surprised by that. Um, I think if you hear the chances are you're already concerned and already doing better than the average. But um, it's nice to have a few other people who are thinking, oh, I'm, I may be a long way away, but I need to know what, what I need to do. So, and a few don't know, and yeah, we can help you with that too. So I'm impressed that one person reckons they're already close to it. So that's good. <laughs> well done to them. Right, um, I'll finish that poll and I shall go a bit further with the, oops, sorry. Um, this is where my, um, this is where my knowledge of Zoom comes in. Right, okay. <clears throat> I've gone to the next slide. Stuart, do you want to just uh, address a couple of the comments in the chat before we move on to the next right. bit? Okay. Um, there's a question 
First of all, saying why focus on carbon footprint instead of ecological footprint? Do you want to comment um, on that? The, easy, the, the reason is simplicity. Um, well, no, there are a number of reasons. One is it's easier to measure a carbon footprint than the ecological footprint. Um, the, the science and the arithmetic is a lot simpler. Um, the second argument is that, um, well, I mean, that, that is the main argument. Um, but it's, it's more difficult to do ecological footprints and to see where you are in relation to um, the global situation. That there's been a lot less research on what your lifestyle ecological footprint could be, um, particularly in the various factors that affect wildlife. It's just a lot harder. Uh, WWF have tried to do some of this, um, but I don't think it's quite at the level um, that I'm of the information that I'm able to give you today. That there simply isn't enough information in other areas to do to give you the level of detail that I can give you um, in, on the on the climate change issue. Um, there's an, a new question that says, could you clarify what is in the total carbon footprint that's not in lifestyle? So that's mostly public um, public services. So the stuff the government funds directly that you as a consumer don't affect. So that's things like the health service, the, um, the military, um, a few other big capital projects, some infrastructure projects are in there, some of the big infrastructure projects in there. There, there is a bit of a debate between researchers in this area. Um, the Hot or Cool Institute argues that it's around 70%, but um, looking at Mike Berners-Lee's figures, for example, he interprets it more narrowly. Um, so his figures sort of point towards 85, 90% being under our control. It, it's, yeah, there's some debate about that, but it's mainly public services. Thank you. I think the other um, questions are more comments than questions. So um, I think we can just note those and, and move on if that's OK, or maybe come back to them later if anybody wants to pick up on those. Thanks. Yes. OK, we'll come, I'll come and look through those later. OK, so eight and a half tonnes is where the current lifestyle carbon footprint is and, um, and the target's two and a half tonnes. So. Uh, I think I'm going to have to unshare and reshare because the buttons aren't working. Excuse me for this. While you're doing that, could I just ask Johanna, Carrie, um, would you mind switching your video camera off just because it helps people that are in areas with poor broadband if there's less video? Thank you. Right, OK, so the current UK situation, this is the 8.5 tonnes divided up amongst um, five key areas. So you can see the biggest area is personal transport. So that's things like planes, cars, uh, public transport, stuff like that. Housing is home energy, electricity, heating, um, and, um, and um, the embodied energy of the buildings comes into that. Food is around the growing, the emissions of particularly the animals, uh, methane, um, emissions from fertilizers and production of um, in the life cycle of that. Um, goods are stuff that you buy, that you own, possessions, and then services, services and leisure um, are things that you purchase um, and it, it's kind of a mixed bag of other things. So it's everything from insurance to going out for dinner. So that gives you an idea of where the big areas or, or the distribution of impacts are. And um, these are the targets. So if you want to get to the 2030 level of um, um, 2.5 tonnes, this is my estimate of where the distribution of action needs to take place or where you need to end up in order to hit those targets. So you can see that personal transport reduces a long way. Um, goods reduce a long way to very little. Food, there's a limit to how much you can do. Um, 
there's still and it ends up being the largest emitting area just because of the nature of, of um, food production systems. Housing to some extent um, is still there, but you can go a long way in a lot of these areas. Um, according to um, Lewis Kenji, who, who's at the Hot and Cool Institute, the, the report he led, um, they put together some data on what individual actions are, um, are on average the most effective in the UK. So this is on average. And, and one of the pitfalls of using tables like this is um, for policymakers, they're very useful because it tells you on average which things need to change um, to have the most effect. But um, in, in on an individual basis, it can be very misleading. If you do, um, if you have a huge car, then that's going to be your biggest impact. Um, if you do loads of flying, that's going to be your biggest impact. Well, that shows up on here. Um, if you have a big drafty house that's not very well insulated, um, that's probably going to be your biggest impact. So this is an average, but it gives you an idea of the big actions that make a difference. So on average, flying is the biggest thing. To avoid flying um, is very high. Um, not using cars, particularly getting rid of your car, or if you have one, um, that makes a big impact. Switching to a vegan diet um, it has a a big impact and then getting down to the the smaller areas some of these things overlap some of these areas uh, some of these things you do together so a lot of stuff in the home for example switching to renewable energy for heating and for electricity um, if insulating your home it may be that you'll do a number of the, these things together I, i've just um, moved into a new house and we've refurbished it with a lot of things so we um, installed a heat pump for example we put in solid wall insulation and loft insulation so we kind of did a few things together so they they mount up but um, there are certain times when you can do lots of things like that if you move house that's a good time to decide okay shall we live closer to the workspace that potentially can make a big difference um, and is often forgot about teleworking, homeworking can make a big difference. Um, and yeah, so those give you an idea of where, where the bigger things tend to be, but you have to look at your own situation um, to find out which, which is going to make the biggest difference for you. Um, oh, there we go. Right. Um, so the first of these areas is personal transport. So what I've done here is try to put together some target levels and, and these target levels can adjust a little bit depending on personal circumstances again, but some of them are quite immutable. So zero flying um, is, is a big one. Um, because of the way the, the lifestyle carbon footprint is produced, this is zero flying for personal and leisure purposes. Zero flying for work is accounted for in a different way. So, but if you have the option to avoid flying at work, then that adds to um, the benefit, but it, it isn't counted within the lifestyle carbon footprint. Um, and then other things, no car ownership is, as we talked about, the biggest thing. So if you, if you take all these actions, it brings your carbon footprint in this area down to 0.7 tonnes. Um, so a little bit under a third of the um, target level. Um, and yeah, there's some guidelines here about train travel, um, bus, long distance train travel, bus and short distance train travel, um, car travel, if you do things like lift share, um, and walking and cycling and other things and avoiding some of the big impact stuff that doesn't happen very often like getting on a cruise ship or a speedboat or a steam train uh, particularly high impact even if you do it once or twice um, so there's and to give you an idea about 5,000 kilometers um, it's I, I did some calculations about this I, I think it's something like um, four or five journeys London to Manchester give you an idea so um it's quite easy to use that that distance up visiting family for example so um so there are are some restrictions there um housing the easiest target um 
the easiest way to define a target in this area is about home energy consumption. So you can do all sorts of things to help reduce the energy consumption per person per year. Um, and that's everything from insulating their house better or sharing with more people in your house, renting out a room, um, changing the, the heat. Well, no, I'll come on to heat supply in a minute. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of inefficiency things, in, uh, efficient um, appliances, for example. And you can check that um, the figure 3,500. If you if you have a smart meter, which most people do now, do learn how to use it, um, and it will give you an idea of what your daily consumption is. And um, a, a good target from that is about 10 kilowatt hours per day. Um, it's going to be more than that in the winter and less than that in the summer. That will give you an idea um, of what you're using, and that's combined heating and hot water electricity. Um, if you it gets more complicated when you have things like a wood burning stove, which is which is a whole issue in itself, and maybe we can take up in the discussion because um, there's a lot of problems with air pollution with wood burning stoves. So um, it's it's a, a difficult one. Um, and then the yes, the energy that brings me nearly onto the energy supply. So switching to a high quality supplier of renewable energy for your grid supply. So good energy or ecotricity are the two companies that have the most rigorous standards for their supply. Um, if you can do things like a solar panel on the roof, that can make a big difference here. Um, and that can supply most of your electricity. And, and bear in mind that the grid is in the, as we have seen recently, um, is still got 40% gas supply on it. Um, which makes it not only vulnerable to the vagaries of the international gas market, but of course that's a big source of fossil fuels. Um, and the other one that doesn't get much mention and um, crops up occasionally is around the embodied energy in home maintenance in, in the home. So building homes and maintaining homes actually can take a lot of carbon. And so there's an estimate here related to floor space. Um, and um, the recommended level is about 30 metres per square. So have a think about how, you know, how big your houses are and um, how much that works. Um, there's some interesting things here about how we count things like rooms that are rented out, um, rooms that are rented out for holiday lets, for example, like an Airbnb let. That's another way of using space more efficiently or a home office. Um, so doing those sorts of activities can kind of reduce um, the, um, the things that you can within your own carbon footprint. Um, and then there's food. Um, and I've collected together, together a number of things because these all overlap. Um, but the biggest one, as you saw in the earlier table, was minimal animal foods, um, more or less a vegan diet from a carbon perspective. Um, and then, yes, biodiversity and, and um, and animal welfare issues will come in there as well. Air freighted foods and food waste can be both high impact um, and, and avoiding deforestation. A lot of the deforestation impacts are actually worse, worse for other parts of the ecological footprint. Um, and you're losing areas of pristine forest. Um, um, so that's often the, the bigger factor um, related to foods which contribute to deforestation. So that's things like Beef is the, the biggest one, um, and then things like soya and palm oil, but a lot of that is used as animal feed. Uh, so avoiding animal products um, will tackle most of that issue. Um, and then goods, there's a whole bunch of things here. Um, I'm not going to try and go through them all, but it gives you an idea. To pick out a couple of things here, um, generally buying second hand is, is surprisingly, unsurprisingly, the big issue, but um, a low con consumption of anything new and then being able to judge and that there's um, some guidance here about how high the carbon footprint of various goods are. So things like electronics and furniture have a high carbon footprint um, and clothes and shoes are kind of medium. And, and as you go further down the list, you can buy a few more things a year in each of those categories. And then there's, there's some categories that are just so high carbon that you, it's better to avoid them altogether. And jewellery, 
probably won't be surprising if it, um, you probably won't be surprised diamonds and gold have a massive environmental and human impact. But something like commercial cut flowers um, really surprised me. It's like one bunch is one of, it's one of the highest carbon footprints of a commonly sold product on the high street. Um, it's um, yeah, really quite amazing. And then another one that's awkward um, for a lot of people is around pets, and it's particularly the big meaty deep pets are the ones that um, have a significant carbon footprint. Um, and then the final category um, is sales and leisure, and there's a couple of things here. Um, the data here is a lot more contested and a lot harder to find, um, but things like ethical investment can tackle that problem and um, trying to stay in an eco-friendly accommodation um, when traveling or camping. Um, a couple of actions that are sort of transition actions, they won't, they're not compatible with the 2030 targets, but they might get you to, they might help you transition to the 2030 targets. Um, and the two things I picked out here, which are particularly significant, um, is electric cars um, and um, a vegetarian diet as opposed to a vegan diet. Those are sort of stepping stones to um, a lower carbon lifestyle or the, or the 2030 target. And then the good news is all the great things you can do that are very low carbon and you don't have to think too much about the carbon footprint of them. And this is kind of a, a brainstorm list and a be interested in, in people adding to this, um, particularly in, in the discussion sessions. They, this comes out of some discussions and websites that um, we had and we've had contact with in the organisation. So um, there's, all, there, there's no end of things. And maybe I should have started off by listing all the good things that you can do um, and, and the various benefits, the various health benefits, environmental benefits of doing all these positive things. And I think a lot of them were rediscovered by people during lockdown, for example, um, and um, can provide a lot of, um, a lot of um, quality of life and well-being aspects um, that are often lost in a, in a consumerist lifestyle. So um, I'll just end briefly, and maybe this will take into account some of the um, issues that, that have come up so far. I mean, uh, the key thing is it, individual action is not a replacement for government corporate action, but because, and, and then you'll see this in the government announcements today and the low carbon strategy is that there's no serious ambition there. And one of the things that we need to do is to show that actually a lot of these actions are desirable. And, and um, it's interesting, the response, for example, like the rapid growth in veganism has caused supermarkets to put a lot more vegan food on the shelves. It's become a much more of an issue and the idea of, of um, the, the farming sector feels under pressure to reform. Um, and while the government isn't quite at the point of saying we're going to restrict meat in certain ways, it's certainly that's a conversation that we were, could barely have a, a, only a few years ago. So it, it does spur action beyond the individual. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind lifestyle actions by leading figures. And one of the things that we're doing as an organisation is promoting, encouraging scientists to take these actions through our science oath for climate is that if you're an influential figure in some way, um, doing this and being seen to be, do, to be doing environmental and, and, and climate friendly actions can be significant far beyond your own, uh, your own individual impacts. Um, and it's worth bearing in mind, uh, climate change is, is a, such a big justice issue. And if you do have more money, you have more power to act. In, a, in, in various ways. Um, if you've done all the things in your individual life, like got rid of your car and stopped flying, ethical investment, uh, investing your pension ethically in a low carbon or a zero carbon pension can have a large impact because that would be tens of thousands or possibly hundreds of thousands of money uh, of pounds going into um, better, better um, places. Um, and, Never forgetting that 
political action is extremely important. And particularly if you're on your low income and you don't have much buying power and you don't have much influence to change the, the, the consumer elements of the world, then, then political action is key. And arguably it should be the thing you focus on um, rather than the, uh, you know, the one or two percent that you hire that you can easily affect in your own life. Um, and publicizing behavior changes um, without bragging is really important. So social co contagion, um, the psychologists call it, um, and doing it in an encouraging and supportive way is, is really important. So, and I'm sure there are a lot of other issues. So I will stop there and um, stop sharing my slides and we can start to have a chat about um, 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 some of the things in the chat.